Hello, friends, and welcome to A Cabin on the Rocks podcast. This is your host, Tony Anderson, a.k.a. Fast Tony. Really excited to uh, have Rafael Gael on the show today. People know him uh, probably best as the drummer at Percussion uh, behind Leonard Cohen. Uh, and world tour from 2008 through and records through 2015. Rafael, hello, and thank you so much for joining us today. Super excited to have you here with us. Glad to be here. We only recorded, we only toured until uh, December 21st, 2013, but, but 2015 is when the last record that was live, I think, came out. So, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I did some homework and I got you down here on some notes that uh, 2000, uh, 2015, they're like the last, the last, one of the last records. Uh, Auckland, New Zealand, that was your, your last show there with Leonard uh, right before Christmas, 2013. Yes, the, the, the Vector Arena. Wow. Yes. That's fantastic. I just missed you. I was in living in New Zealand for a year and a half up there right. in Northland. Yeah, Bay of Islands. Pretty fantastic. So, uh, yeah, it's a it's far away place. Yes, it is. Like another planet. It is. Yeah. And and the people but the people are very down to earth. Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. They're uh, it's so nice. It was amazing. I was actually, uh, you know, we, well, we crossed paths when uh, you came through with Leonard Cohen uh, to SIR Studios in Hollywood. And uh, it was amazing as I went back. And I know we crossed paths and talked about Austin, Texas, because you have a connection and spent a lot of time there. I played with a lot of musicians in Austin, and as I did, too. I lived there a couple times and was in and out of there for a 10-year period. Is it fair to say that your musical path started in new orleans in the french quarter it really began in santa monica california okay were you st a student or i always wanted to be a drummer since my mom took me to see west side story uh -huh. when i was uh about four years old wow back in back in the day when it first came out and all i remembered was the colors on the screen and the music. I had no idea what the story was about. I didn't even know who Romeo and Juliet was then. And um, she bought the soundtrack album for me for, for my fourth birthday. And I played it to death. And so I ended up playing my aunt's version because I lived with an extended family in Chicago, Illinois. Okay. Uh, that's where my mom is from. And so I, I so her, so my aunt, would bring her version, her her copy of it over, and I scratched and played that to death as well. And I, I don't know how many vinyl copies of West Side Story I've gone through, but Columbia Records should thank me. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, what a cool mom. Um. Yeah, that was the thing that that kind of put the bug in me. And shortly after that, it was seeing, of course, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and and Buddy Rich for wow. that matter. Just seeing those, just seeing that band and that drummer. And the excitement that both of them, in their own way, you know, projected, uh, it, it just kind of caught me, and I never stopped thinking about it. We lived in an apartment until I was 14, so I never had a drum set. was never really around a drum set for an extended period of time. But the, the strange thing was is that if there was a, uh, a snare drum, say, at school, and sticks i would go to it and and just start playing in time and playing things on it and eventually found my way into the high school marching band when i was in eighth grade they needed a snare drummer and they, they said i could be in their in their group if i wanted to so that that was my first i guess introduction to playing a musical instrument in front of you know a large amount of people and kind of getting through that that thing about it it was all it was all unknown exciting and uh -huh. and that that that's kind of where it started um i finally got a drum set when i was 14 and um i was getting into so much mischief that my mom knew i had to settle down <laughs> into uh -huh. something and she knew i was always you know banging on things around the apartment and breaking things uh, -huh. uh in 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 that succession so when uh we uh, moved into our first house. It was in Malibu, California. Okay. Uh, she bought a uh, used drum set in the classified ads for about a hundred bucks, kind of like a litmus test. Yeah. And um, I took to it uh, pretty quickly and found my way coming home from school about a month later after getting that kit. 
hearing a group practice in a garage. And I walked, I walked by this garage a couple of times, and they were always practicing after school, but I never heard drums. So I think around the second or third time, I banged on the door, and it was these these guys. These, you know, I was fourteen; they were, you know, practically twenty one uh-huh. out of high school, and they uh, were practicing songs. Didn't have a drummer, and they had long hair, and the and the, it reeked of smoke, and uh-huh. there were bottles of wine and beer everywhere. And yeah, <laughs> I just said, uh, "Can do you guys need a drummer? I, I would love to play." And they, I don't know, they they said yes. Wow. And it started this long association with these two brothers. Um, that that uh, the the lead singer, lead guitarist, and his brother, uh, who also sang and played bass, uh, welcomed me into their their band and into their family for for a long, long time. It was a it was a real uh, interesting, wild and fast growing period for me after being a, a repressed Catholic for eight years. Um, well, shortly after getting out of uh, eighth grade in St. Monica's Elementary, I, I went straight into um, public school junior high, into Malibu Park Junior High School. Okay. And I played my first um, uh, school dance with, with this band. And I was also working uh, weekend jobs uh, as a as a busboy and a dishwasher at uh, this one restaurant called Ted's El Rancho. And then, uh, at, and then at night, I would wash dishes at Moon Shadows, which is that, that famous... Yep. Uh, restaurant uh so uh anyway within about a year of doing those two jobs i saved up enough money to buy like this brand new slingerland drum set and brand new zildjian cymbals and my mom realized that she'd created a monster and i just started i started getting invited to play with other groups while i was still in high school other groups who were these guys who were already who had already graduated high school were of you know adult age and they just wanted a young drummer or just needed a drummer i think for the most part so i uh i started work, working with a lot of other people um by the time mm-hmm. uh, do you remember any of the songs that you guys were playing in this band it was like everything from almond brothers almond brothers to crosby stills nash and young yep um some rolling stones um so you got your feet wet uh, it's where I got my feet wet, and and also in in junior high school. It's also where I met uh, a fellow buddy musician, uh, guitarist named Michael Penn. Oh, okay, yes, and uh-huh. the Sean Penn's uh, brother. Um, he's related, yes, <laughs> yes, and 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 let's not leave out Christopher, the, the late great Christopher Penn. I've heard the solo record, Michael Penn. Yeah, he's he's got several out. He's um, he's a, a prolific writer. He's one of the best guitar players on the planet. He's uh, in in my in my book. He he's like one of the one of the funniest people I've ever met, and and I love him dearly, and I miss him. And um, we we communicate via Twitter once in a while. <laughs> anyway, um, Michael Michael introduced me to the Beatles in a big way, uh-huh. and I introduced him to Frank Zappa. Okay. <laughs> Terrific. And, and 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 as ninth graders, I couldn't drive, so my mom would drive the 15 mile trek up the coast to his house, uh, where where his family lived, and um, and he would set up his his guitar. I think he had a, a Les Paul and, and a Marshall at the time, uh, maybe even a Reckenbacher. Okay. And um, and I had this this big ass kit that my mom could barely fit into her car and she'd drive me up and Michael and I would just play all day staring at each other, no bass player, no band really to put together. And, and then we'd take a break and his, uh, his mom and their, their housekeeper would serve us uh, milk and Oreo cookies. And we just <laughs> listen to music and, and we, we, did, we did this a couple of times and then, and then started, you know, running into different groups throughout high school, but we always ran back into each other and, and kept in touch. And then after graduation, I kept on playing with other people. I was in a disco cover band for two years. Uh huh. We did a lot of work in Antelope Valley and okay. in um, San Diego, uh, you know, playing uh, disco covers back in 19, let's see, it was 1978 through 1979. So it was the perfect time to be a disco drummer. I'm not. I'm not ashamed of it, really. You know, it's. Uh, I learned a lot. I, I learned about keeping time, and, and I learned a lot about grooving. There was this bass uh-huh. player I worked with who, who really, he really helped me settle down and stop trying to, you know, 
play all my riffs in, in one song. Uh-huh. It, was, it was really a, a turning point. His name is Gary Lux. Uh-huh. And uh, anyway, so. That's a fantastic start. So, yeah, you, so your roots are really in California, as, as like, like myself. So that's, that's really cool. And Malibu. I've spent some time living in Malibu also. So that's really cool. Uh, up yeah, I, I, I grew up there for the most part. I mean, everything, every, everything big in my life happened well uh, the, during my youth happened there wow that's fantastic that's uh yeah that's a special place for sure i, I live not far up from zuma seven uh, where the shangri-la studio is at and behind the occupational uh-huh. school back there and uh just I had many adventures and uh just about three and a half years living with a girlfriend in a guest house out there selling artwork door to door and um just soaking it in and enjoying it at, it always reminded me of like the beverly hills hillbillies in a way that people had you know money like beverly hills but they had horses and they were you know uh, there was a lot of ranch element too to malibu for sure and still is i'm sure so you know yeah it surprised me a lot because i i had all my school friends they lived in those rural areas and on these you know big plots of land with these homesteads uh-huh. and 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 nice homes and then there were also my friends who lived right on the beach in these beach, you know, beach houses that were, you know, packed right next to each other. Yeah. And that was that was a completely different community. Um, but uh, we all we all had a good time together. I got to say it was it was a time when I could hitchhike up and down the coast highway without really having any problem. Yeah. I did. And I did every day. I mean, I, ra- I ran into a few weirdos, but, uh-huh. but I, I I never I mean, they they were. I think they were more nervous than anything, and I just would tell them to fuck off. <laughs> you know, just just pull over at the next light or something, or or no, <laughs> just yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, it took. It, it was once I moved out of of California and lived around the United States and went and lived abroad in New Zealand. Could I even grew, my appreciation for Southern California just grew all that much more, and it was like okay, you know, you like you 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 just really learn to appreciate where it was you're from when you go, you can just contrast it to other places. So, uh, you know, yeah. the, when you, when you blast it off out of California, uh, do you remember is, 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 uh, the French quarter, one of the first places that you went uh-huh. and yeah. did some work on uh, Charlie Sexton's records, uh, under the wishing tree in 94. Uh-huh. Yep. That's cool. I lived in the French Quarter for a year. I toured around that Kingsway studio. I, I don't know. Maybe I was trying to get a job in there or something, you know, like nice. <laughs> doing yeah. something in the kitchen or something. I don't know. I knew about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I knew about Daniel Lanois and I knew about Oh Mercy, uh, the Bob Dylan record. And so I was uh, and I lived on near Charters and Dumaine or wherever it was. And uh huh. Yep. So and I lived in a couple places out there and uh, that was pretty exciting. So. Yeah, my wife's from New Orleans. Oh, she is. That's amazing. There's so much yeah, going on there. Yeah. It's the, uh, you know, the city slogan: "Come as you are, leave different." Oh, is that? What, is the, I haven't heard that one. I've heard, I've heard other others, but yeah, "Come as you are, leave different." Yeah, and and I also, when living there, I also That's heard funny. it. I heard it referred to a lot as Northern Costa Rica too by a lot of locals there. That. Oh yeah, that's a, that's another one I've never heard. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, I I I have a uh, I mean New, New Orleans yeah the first time I, I visited New Orleans was for a New Year's Eve gig with a band called the Bodines uh-huh. uh huh we 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 went down there to to play uh, the Hard Rock Cafe on New Year's Eve uh, in 1989 going into 1990 yeah and um, it was uh, it was an interesting experience being uh, like December and nothing was really happening except there was a, a big game at the Superdome so all the hotels were full and people were out on the streets and having a good time and I didn't I didn't know what to expect from New Orleans because I didn't didn't really have any research on it didn't have any background on it didn't know you know th- what a second line you know rhythm was uh-huh. just uh, I I I just uh, started listening to um, a record called Acadie okay. um, from uh, Daniel Lanois and knew that he had recorded it down there. And while I was down there, the keyboardist in the Bodine, the gentleman, a very, very good friend of mine by the name of Michael Ramos, uh, had worked with uh, a, a guitarist originally from Fort Worth who had made his home down in New Orleans for uh-huh. some time named Mason Ruffner. 
um, Mason plays guitar on Daniel Anwa's first record. Right. And Michael and Mason had known each other prior to that because Mason had his own uh, recordings out. I think it was on Epic Records. It was a record uh, in particular called Gypsy Blood. Yeah. And um, so uh, Michael and I went over to Mason's place, hung out with him. Mason told me about, you know, living down there. And he he was trying to, I think, get us over to Kingsway just to visit it. But uh-huh. uh it was new. It was New Year's Eve, and things just weren't happening. You know, okay. it was like right. I don't think any anybody was around, and anything was open. But uh, about six months later, while we were uh, while I was with the Bodines, they were we were uh, talking to different record producers, and one of the record producers that uh, they were interested in was uh, Malcolm Malcolm Byrne. Uh huh. And it was, I think that was based on the um, on the. Um, just work that he's done, you know, down down there with uh, the Neville brothers, and and also with with Daniel Anwa, and mm-hmm. just the the idea of like working down at, at Kingsway would have been a lot of fun, and so we went back down. I think we had a gig at tip at tips at Tipitina's, and yeah. so uh, while we were there, our A and R person, the fantastic, legendary, uh, and uh, she's gone too soon. She left us. I think it was. Last year, I, I'm not sure either last year or the year before. Her name is Roberta Peterson. Okay. Uh, she was our A&R person at uh, Warner Brothers. She met with us over at Kingsway, and we met with Malcolm, and I was all for it, man. I I mean, as soon as I walked into the place, I was like, yeah, let's yeah. do a record here. This would be like a dream come true. Right. Yeah. It definitely had an aura to the place, you know. I mean, I was like compelled to like. Yeah. I really, I, I was like doing everything I could to like get it, get a look in there and go, you know. So I remember. It was... Yeah, for for anyone uh, listening to the uh, to our to our podcast, uh, look at Kingsway Studios in New Orleans. It's a beautiful website. It'll show you some of the history of it. Yeah. Anyway, um, so we. Uh, we ended up making the record over at Paisley Park with David Z. Oh, okay. And that was that that yeah. uh, that also was like a incredible experience, and I had no idea that was going to happen. Jeez. Um. Uh. I I thought we were going to end up making the record in Wisconsin where we were based because we had done so much recording there in our in our re- rehearsal studio to begin with. I thought that we were just going to go low budge and and do it that way and then we ended up spending almost you know six months on and off and uh, at paisley park making a record it was just amazing and david was also just a a fantastic uh, just guy to hang out with as well as such an incredibly talented musician and engineer and and producer and just he's got his his um, sense of arrangement really had a, a great effect on me and he's just so so wonderful that's phenomenal so we got to make that record there but then so so when so when 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 the record we made at paisley park came out there was another record that came out that year in 1991 called living with the law by okay. chris whitley okay then it was his first it was his first record and it was produced by malcolm Byrne at kingsway and when i heard that record i just i went into a, a I, I started like spinning around the room like a crazy person going, why didn't we make the record there? You know, just, <laughs> you know I'm sure. just like, because I mean, with, with all res- yeah, with all respect to the record we made and, and to David and, and of course to, to the amazing Paisley park, just um, the vibe, you know, it right. was so different. It was, it was night and day. Yeah. Um, so, and, and I, and anyway, since we're still talking about new Orleans years later, when I'm in, Austin, Texas. Um, I, I, I uh, had met Charlie, Charlie Sexton, through the Bodines at a at a show we did at Liberty Lunch yeah. once. And then after moving there years later, Charlie came to um, to my attention again through Michael Ramos. He, Charlie uh, was looking to put a band together. Yeah. Uh, after the Archangels, and he right. was he was. Working with, he was working with some drummers already, but it had remembered me, and he came over to the Steamboat yep. on Sixth Street to watch me play one night. And I think it was shortly after that he and I were recording um, some songs that actually I think one of them became uh, uh, one of the I think it was the first single for the record that we did okay. uh, under the Wishing Tree. Yeah, called Every Everyone Will Crawl. So once Charlie was ready to make another record for MCA, um, he he was really keen on working with Daniel Anwa, uh-huh. and um, 
he had, he had been in talks with Daniel about it. And Daniel, I think at that point said, why don't you make the record with Malcolm? Uh-huh. And so um, we had a meeting with Malcolm or Charlie. I actually, Charlie met with him. And before we knew it, Malcolm uh, was living in Austin, Texas, right. <laughs> working with this, making, making music out of this uh, room that Charlie had converted into like a practice space slash recording studio for one, Okay, you know, for, it was, it, it really didn't fit that many other people in there comfortably. So it was at a place called the Austin Rehearsal Complex. Oh yeah, ARC. Yeah. And uh, yeah, ARC. It was oh, it was yeah. a great place. It was run it was run by Wayne Nagel and Don Harvey. Yep. And it 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 uh, it was like it was like a second home for for us wayward musicians. Yeah. <laughs> we got to you know rehearse, record, and and hang out and socialize, and it was it was never a dull time at at ARC. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, the Malcolm's Walsh there uh, making a record. Yeah, right. Um, if um, any, anyway, Malcolm was there for uh, several weeks working with us on some songs. And then at some point he wanted us to come over to Kingsway, which, you know, we went there. I, I, did, I thought we were just going to spend like a week just doing some finish up, you know, tracks or overdubs and things. We were there for a month and we just kept recording and, and doing things and having fun and trying ideas. And Kingsway, when you record there, there's no separation booths. Everything is right there. Okay. You have the drums set up right to the console. Yeah. And old school. And people and people are smoking, and it's cool, and you can do whatever mm. you want. And and, and so mix. we were just like right all together, and like we could hear each other breathe. So when the tape wow. was rolling and the red lights were on, it was just this this how do you say urgent intimacy yeah if you will it sounds like it where where you 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 wanted to like nail it but at the same time your your you know your bandmate was closer to you than they than they would be say on a on a regular stage it was it was something else that's really cool and um i i think that that's why that record has such great great legs even to this day uh-huh. i mean it didn't it didn't sell really at all it did it did okay. rather well in canada but um I, you know, nobody really remembers it except those who who have a copy of it because most people who, that I've spoken to have a copy of it have two, uh-huh. um, just in case they <laughs> lose it or break it. I <laughs> love <know>? it. <laughs> That's true. Cool. And um, it's it's that kind of record. I'm really really proud of it. Yeah. It's, uh, some of my best work. Uh huh. Okay. People check it out. Yes. Yeah. I love that. Had a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Had a lot of fun. And working with Charlie is is like it's 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 like he's he's this musical you know encyclopedia right of of playing anything that comes to his ear yeah and and he can play it not only on guitar he can play the bass he can play violin he can and yeah. he can play drums he's an amazing drummer he's got he's got he's got deep deep pockets when it comes to playing drums just like solid yeah, I've met him and his brother Will a couple times, and uh, just from living yeah. out of Austin, and also through SAR. And I know that Charlie mm-hmm. spent a lot of time at Antone's growing up, studying Stevie Ray Vaughan, and yeah. uh, just taking all that in. And just and I've seen him with Bob many times sure. o- over the years between '99 and oh yeah, 2000, yeah oh yeah, 2000, wow. yeah yeah. I, I had a couple tours with some other people that I was playing with, and on my days off, I would. I was on the same loop there where Bob was playing around the Northeast Chicago and Boston and New York city. And, uh, so I caught him all over and I'd catch him in LA and I'd catch them when they were playing in Austin, just wherever I was. And I'd try to catch it and see, see what they're up to. And, uh, he has such a great tone sure. and so much, just such, you know, like yourself on drums, finesse, you know, just, uh, the silence between the notes, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I I thank you for for saying that. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. With with Charlie, with, with Charlie, he 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 plays the song, and and when he plays the lead, you know, it 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 relates to the song, and then, uh-huh. and, then and then the song relates back back, and it it becomes you know something that it becomes like this this whole that that is greater than just the the parts. Of yeah, yeah. I was surprised when I was reading through that. When you played a little bit on a couple of Bob Schneider records too, and uh, a couple of mutual friends uh, in the his band, uh, Derek Morris keyboards, uh, Adam Temple on guitar, 
those were guys I knew. And uh, Der- Timo. Yeah, Der- Derek was Der- yeah. Derek was one of the first guys I met in Austin when I moved there the first time in '95 and played on played. Uh-huh. On, he came and played on one of my first records at uh, Top Hat Recording. John Harvey. I don't even know if the studio is still there, but uh, yeah, it's so cool. Derek's just fantastic, and Adam Temple is a complete he is. ball of fun. You know, uh, just <laughs> I love. I love I, I love Adam Temple. He's so funny, and he, yeah. he lets me he he let he lets me run run my fingers through his beard every time. And I just love it. His his yeah. beard's like longer than most people's hair. Oh and yeah, it's just this this, yeah. this experience you have to kind of understand. Yeah, he, he, yeah. He's and Adam's just a cool guy. My 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 wife Shannon, she she loves Adam. Uh-huh. He's just you know he's. Yeah. There's nobody like Adam. Yeah, I've gotten into mischief <laughs> with both those guys in several states you know like texas and california mostly uh-huh. but uh just uh uh-huh. yeah just so cool so uh you know i really I, I i know people probably uh had the pleasure to see you with leonard cohen just all over europe all over the world and uh i, I just i mean i had just such a great time i felt so honored that the, all the the years i spent working at sir and you guys were in and out of there many 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 months over a few years there and uh, I remember every day I used to just eat my lunch right next to the rehearsal room, next to the kitchen that you guys played in the back of. And you could basically just hear all the music. And people would come up to me and say, Tony, what are you doing back here? And I, thinking I was being, you know, antisocial or something. And I'd just say, music sounds good back here. And, you know, just so cool just to sit there and, you know, hear a lot of the stuff you guys were running through. And, uh, just amazing you know and how just cordial and and uh just kind leonard cohen was you know to everybody it just permeated through your whole crew and camp you know i mean uh ego checked at the door and uh nobody running amok it seemed like a real great musical family there it most certainly was um yeah i mean when when we talk about leonard it's um there's just nothing quite like the, the I, I wasn't even prepared for it. And I thought I was, uh-huh. I mean, I, I've been listening to Leonard since I was 11, uh, since I was 11 o'clock, since I was 11 years <laughs> uh-huh. old. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, even during the auditions, which there were several, okay. I, I, I thought, okay, you know, this is how it's going to go. I didn't know that we were going to uh, rehearse for 11 weeks straight initially wow. um but uh but there but there was so much i didn't know <laughs> just so so much um le- leading leading up to the first uh days of the tour which then i found out at, uh, later on was only we uh, you know they uh roscoe beck our our wonderful musical director and yes. bassist of the world and yeah dear close friend of mine i'm i'm so proud to say uh he when he uh, invited me onto the tour, he uh, had said that it was just going to be for a year. Because I, 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 I'd asked him, I said, "How much? I mean, how long is this tour scheduled for?" He said, "Well, we need you for about a year." And um, and then I found out uh, as we were getting closer to the first day of the tour that that we were only booking at this point thirty days worth of shows uh, up in the Maritimes in uh, Canada in uh-huh. small theaters just to see how the reaction would, would be. Right. Because Leonard, who had been um, missing in action, you know, for like 15 years, he, he'd, he'd retired, you know. Yeah. Um, and after, and, a, and after uh, uh, you know, putting a band back together and rehearsing and then announcing tour dates, he was still um, not completely convinced, I think, that, that uh, people were... Uh, uh-huh. Wanting That's... to see him in, in, in such large, large, large numbers, he, he, I, I, I think deep down inside, he wasn't sure just how relevant, you know, sure. all, all, all of it was going to be. Yeah. But um, I gotta say, I've never seen anything spark so quickly. Yeah. And and spread and spread so fast. Yeah. People... With such ferocity as this tour. Yeah. <laughs> it's That's... Just, I mean. I'm, Tony, Tony, we went, we went from the first night in, um, uh, Fredericton, uh, which is in New Brunswick in the okay. Maritimes of Canada yep. 
seven hundred people in a in a small theater, lovely theater in Fredericton on a Sunday night. Seven hundred people. Forty five days later, to headlining Glastonbury in front of ninety thousand people. Wow. Yeah. I, I... And and I wasn't even read. I wasn't even like that. That that didn't sink in until maybe I think the day later as we were leaving. I thought, whoa, you know if that we what can we go back and do that again you know it was just (laughs) like incredible you didn't know this was going to go on for years well i then i had and i still didn't know until way later but i mean as we did these dates in um i actually as we were leading up to the first date we knew that the shows were were starting to to multiply in in the same city that they were adding extra dates they Uh were making room for that right having 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 a feeling that in say toronto or Montreal, or even um, uh, Halifax, for some reason, yes. uh, that it was going to go. We played five. We with that first month, we played five nights in Halifax. Wow. We played. We played. I think three nights in Toronto and two nights in Montreal, and um, and okay. I think we split Montreal in in between five nights in Manchester, England. We flew over to Manchester uh-huh. to do. Uh, like the Manchester off. I, I don't know. I, I, I'd have to look at the schedule again, but there was one time where we had to break up those 30 days and go over to England because there was such demand and they wanted to see him like right now. Wow. <laughs> so they, they booked, they booked, uh, they booked us, uh, in Dublin. Yep. And in, um, and in, uh, then Manchester. They, right. And we did. Yeah. So, in, and in Dublin, we, we played, uh, I think two, two nights, two or three nights, uh, outs, outside 12, 12,500 people a night at this place called the Royal Hospital. Yep. Um, which is in an, which is in an area of Dublin on the hills of Kilmainham. Okay. And they've turned this hospital into a museum with this sprawling like green out there hill with a area, you know, level enough that they could create this stage big enough to facilitate, you know, 12, 12 and a half thousand people. And we played, we played most of the time in the rain and wow. all shows were, were packed to capacity with people holding umbrellas, wearing their, their, uh, and loving their, their raincoats and, t- <laughs> and telling each other to shut up. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> because, because what I mean, our, our shows are so quiet and Leonard likes to recite, you know, poetry as yes. well. And of course, you know, I- Ireland is no stranger to, to that. And I, and they, they come not only for the music, but they come for the, for the, you know, for the, um, how would you say the his his reciting yeah. of, of his poetry? Yeah, I see three nights in Dublin, and then four nights in Manchester, and then you guys went back to Montreal after that. Four, there it is. Yeah, four nights at the Manchester Opera House. That was great. I love Manchester. I, I took a bunch of pictures out uh-huh. there, over there, and I wanted to get over to uh, Salford and take a picture of the Salford Lads House where the Smiths first met and yeah. formed. You know, uh-huh. I wanted to see some of that history that was cool yeah i guess johnny Mars out playing with blondie now i just saw that wow yeah i just saw that so, i just uh yeah i've been, I've been reading his uh, autobiography oh fantastic yeah what a sound he's got uh, johnny Mars has got a book he's got a book called set the boy free it's very very good okay and these shows that you play with leonard cohen i mean the length of the shows can we talk about that i mean these were like just these, sure. these crazy shows that were like two plus hours I mean, not just one. They seem like that's how long they all went. There were two parts, intermission in the middle, uh, you know, break it broke up. You yeah. Know. You'd have a full concert, then they a were, break and another concert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were, they were two hours. They quickly evolved to, uh, two and a half hours. Wow. That's amazing. And, uh, and they started and they kept going for two and a half hours until we did uh, this one show in September of 2009 in Tel Aviv uh-huh. at the Ramat Gan Stadium. Uh-huh. And it was a very uh, special show that uh, Leonard had uh, put together. Um, there was a uh, uh, an organization that he formed called the Families for the Bereavement of uh, Peace. OK. And it brought families to. Uh, both from Israel and Palestine together to to uh, come together and speak to one another to console each other over their their loss of a loss of love loved ones during um, you know all the fighting that's been going on for for what seems like ever. 
Wow. Um, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. There, there were. He would be doing that. Yeah, there, there were times when we were doing some shows in uh, the United States leading up to that, to that concert where there were people picketing uh, Leonard's concert. Um, really? They didn't want him to play uh, the show. It was, uh, it was strange. You <laughs> that, know? that is we, strange. All we wanted to do was go there, make, make, make some music, and, and you know, provide a good time. So we did that, and when we did it. The show was longer. It was um, it uh, turned into a three and a half hour show, and from that point on, he never looked back. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. He got on a roll. Well, just such a, I mean, just an amazing band and machine. I say, you know, behind him, they're just, you know, everybody just working together and just putting out this, you know, experience. Really, uh, this this sound of just, I mean, mm -hmm. I've got all the live records, and I mean, I pretty much have his whole catalog. So. Uh, I mean, I was a Leonard Cohen fan before I met all you guys and met, got to meet Leonard. And then after I, you know, was got there, got the opportunity to listen to the rehearsals. I was just like, wow, OK, it really started sinking in. You know, I had new Tower of Song and, you know, some of the, some the, uh -huh. the, and some of the other songs, Boogie Street. And uh, then I really was like, oh, all right. I started hearing all these other songs that I didn't know. And then just just seeing the way that, that he talked to people and the way he treated everybody. It was just, you know, so much integrity and dignity and kindness and humanity that I was like, wow, this guy is like, you know, people just inspire you by how they behave. And, you know, they, they, they send a, they send a message to you of like what they think matters just by how they, uh -huh. how they, how they roll, how they act, what they do every day. So, I mean, it's just, I almost didn't even want to bother him, and I really didn't most of the time. I would, you know, I pretty much rarely, like, just, you know, I'd be just be the guy bringing, in, bringing um, in a keyboard or something. <laughs> yeah, we were right. He, he, you know, I, I, I can understand people maybe want to tiptoe around him, but um, I found out early on just um, that that Leonard, he was definitely of the people, and I know that sounds like a cliche, but. He he always made time for 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 everyone. Um, yeah. N not just strangers who would come up to him, um, but um, you know, band members. When when it it was very, oh, it, the whole process. We were all together all the time, and and I'm not just talking the band. I mean, down to the last truck driver. Right. If he could put all of us in the same hotel. That's yep. what he did because yep. he knew that's how that's how the machine works. That's how you keep things going. Right. That's how you get people to want to, to have your back when you're on the road. Yep. And that's how you get them to feel good about what they're doing at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. He got it. He got it. He did. He, he's just there. There was one time in Philadelphia. We were playing the Tower Theater it was uh -huh. in 2009. We were staying at the Ritz Carlton. And I walked out to go find a place to get a hoagie and take some some photographs. Uh -huh. And one of the truck drivers, one one of the, we had like five semis. One of the truck drivers was standing outside, just a good old boy with his you know, with his jacket on, and he's smoking a cigarette. And yep. we we recognized each other, and I nodded to him, and he nodded back. He as I'm walking away, he's saying, "Hey," and I turn around, came up to him, he's like, "Hey, man." does he treat everybody like this all the time? I'm like, you bet. Wow. He's like, man, I hope this, and he said, man, I hope this gig never ends. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's so, you know, that, that's, yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. I'm not surprised. I love it. And the, yeah. He's just a, a darling. And uh -huh. um, of course, Shannon loved him very much. And he, he was very fond of her too. They, they got on well. There's a great picture of them together at uh, backstage at Caesar's Palace on my debit card. <laughs> I had a photo. I, I can put photos on my debit card, and I uh -huh. have that. Every time I, every time I got to pay for something, I get to thank Leonard. Oh know. my God! <laughs> yeah, if people and and my wife. Yeah. If people haven't seen, if people haven't seen it, I urge them to uh, go on YouTube and look up the band introductions. Leonard Cohen, Las Vegas, 2010, the final show of the 2010 show uh, tour, where he is a. Uh, going around just giving these accolades and the introduction of each individual band member and yours to whenever he got to you, it, they became longer and longer every show as they went on. And, uh, I I'll, I'll let people look it up, but he just, I know he started out with phrases like sculptor of silence. Yeah. It's a poem in itself. He would call me the shepherd of restraint. Shepherd of restraint. Thank you. That's it. 
Yeah, yeah. Sculptor of silence, shepherd of restraint. Oh my gosh, that's uh, yeah, that's so cool that he did. You know, I mean, just it's too bad it's just gone too soon. You know, like another fantastic musician that's just uh, you know left too early. And I, you know, just this this the Canadian broadcasting, ladies and gentlemen, Leonard Cohen. I think it's 1963. Uh, you can see that easily on the Apple TV, uh, CBC uh, uh, app, and it's uh, just Leonard Cohen in the early days. You know, I think it's even before he started uh, really writing songs. It was really more he's just reciting poetry and things, and it's uh, incredible. Yeah, he's at he's at McGill University, his alma mater, that's, that's... and he's um, he's he's addressing uh, the crowd in like a lecture room. But what's so what's so disarming is that you you listen to the first three minutes of of his of his you know talk with with the audience and you realize this guy missed his calling as a stand-up comedian you know yeah. he just he had the place in stitches so quickly and with such intelligence and and restraint i mean he 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 wasn't really laughing along with them he was deadpan saying these things that once they sunk in and they did sink in pretty quickly you realize this guy is so smart and how funny is it you know Just yeah so good yeah when he's talking about his friend in in, in the uh, institution yes you know it's just uh yeah so yeah uh, those who are listening to this <laughs> it's called ladies and gentlemen mr leonard cohen check it out yeah check that out and, and you can see you, you and you can imagine him being like a, a guest on the tonight show <laughs> you know you can see johnny carson bringing him out and leonard goes up there and does his five minutes of stand-up and and then johnny invites him over to the couch that's how good he is yeah yeah you know i i saw i saw another quote uh that uh you were mentioning when you were talking about the tour and you're saying the band played so quietly sometimes you could almost hear dust particles colliding Yes. Wow. That's a, it's quite a, yeah, the, that's quite a comment. We, we played so quietly and the microphones were so hot on stage that I was uh, only allowed to play actual acoustic drums with brushes uh -huh. and I could only use my sticks on the electronic kit because then the front of house engineer could, you know, direct it as, as could, could, you know, adjust, he, he could regulate the, the volume, you know, uh -huh. from there. And that that was the deal. And the mics were hot everywhere. If you coughed on stage, um, you know, it, it would shake through the arena. Wow. <laughs> uh, the, the parking valet could hear you, you know, <laughs> it's just so loud up there. Um, but it, but but it, it, it created that that tension on stage, too, because yeah. Leonard spoke very quietly, but yet his voice had such such command yeah uh, with with that uh you know um oral arrangement it's probably like a conversation it's like a technique when someone yes. speaks quieter the whole audience probably leaning forward leaning in to like hear him like let's let's eat you know you got, he's got their attention even doubly did you have any uh kind of ritual or any kind of with the band before shows or uh you yourself personally meditate or sometimes anything? yeah to say a little uh no oh no no i i would pace that's my that's uh -huh. my ritual i okay. just pace okay uh i mean i'm 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 kind of hyperactive to to some extent yeah as far as like when, when i have to go play i get a little worked up uh, okay <laughs> and, and with leonard with leonard i had to hold back so much sure. all the time and so that made me it was like exercise what i would call i was exercising the muscles of restraint sure which wow. is something i'd never done as a drummer before uh-huh and and so I had to really psych myself up to just hold it down, hold back, and um, and then just wait for it. You yeah. Know? Um, but uh, as a group, we would uh, recite this this chant, um, and I uh, I wouldn't be able to say it right it, now. It's okay. I, yeah. I just, it's right. I, yeah. It's an ancient chant, though. I didn't say. get the. Yeah, I didn't get the memo before the podcast, so I'd, I'd have to look for it in my files. I'm sorry. No, it's be it's probably better. It's just out there in the ether where it belongs. You know, it's. Uh... Well, yeah, I'm sure you could you could um, reference it uh, online. I, I know I've I've seen it uh, online uh, somewhere. Uh huh. So.
Uh-huh. But uh, it's a chant. It, it's a chant. It's a chant. We all started uh, singing with Leonard, which he's done before on previous tours. But I remember the first night we did it, it was one of the five nights we did it in Halifax. I think it was the first night we did it in Halifax. Those five nights that we played there, because I knew they, there was this makeshift green room that was such a cool. It was so well done. Uh-huh. Uh, they did it with, with these like, with these makeshift frames and this this draping and lights behind them and it just oh it was just such a great feeling and i mean the tour was was practically it wasn't even like two weeks new and here it was like this mm-hmm. is how it's every night's going to be different but it's going to feel like this and, yeah um so he he t- he taught us this uh this brief chant which was basically in song with you know we would sing and um and we would do that and sing it together and then sing it on the way to the stage. Very cool. And so by the time you get to the stage, you know, you're not, you're, you're not like going, Oh my God, you know, yeah. <laughs> there's too many people out there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, he's so, he, well, wait a second. <laughs> yeah. His, 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 you know, is there one moment that you can think like, God, that's the funniest memory of playing with Leonard Cohen. I mean, there's so many moments and I mean, just listening to his live shows and some of the things he says and how comical they can be. But did, is there anything that you that stands out that you're like one of the funniest things you ever saw him or maybe not even in a show? Maybe just if you want to share it. I don't know. I mean, can... Oh, well, I mean, L- Leonard, L- Leonard was really um relaxed around me when i had my camera he saw some of the work i'd done and i think that that helped too not uh-huh. that i'm not that i'm trying to pat myself on the back here but i <laughs> I, I had this gargantuan nikon d1x All right. like hanging around my neck like an albatross yeah and and i would take pictures everywhere i went and i and i knew i wanted to take pictures of him and i and i knew he knew he had to have known but i wasn't just about to start snapping just because i'm in the band you know i right. i wanted to ask first be polite and I do, I, I do that to just about anybody on the street that I'm going to take a picture of. I always come up to them first and say, may I take a picture I like that. of you? W- would you mind? And if they say, yeah, then great. It's on. If they say no, I, I say, you know, politely okay. say thank you and walk away. Right. But, but with Len, but with Leonard, I wanted to warm up to that. And once he saw some of the stuff that I was doing, then I would ask him and he was um, most agreeable and he would, he would do some pretty hammy uh stuff sometimes and you know like when we would be traveling if um say if uh, the flight attendant would be passing around certain bags of candy for uh-huh. us to pick from while we were flying he always chose this one candy it was they're called malt teasers it's like malt, uh, chocolate covered malt balls all right you know and they were in there in this red bag and he would like grab them like a kid, you know, like that's mine and get and get it. <laughs> and this one time he grabbed it and, and, and I went to take a picture of him and he put the multi, he put the bag in his mouth <laughs> and just, just like a, like, you know, like it, like it was his and just, and just stood there looking at me and I snapped the picture. It came out great. Wow. So that was, that, that was a good, you know, that's, that's, that's the kind of, rapport he and I had, we, we had fun like that. Fantastic. I could, I could come up if, if if I needed to talk to him about something like say more more serious, I could call him and you know while we were in our in our rooms at at a hotel, I could just call his room and say, hey man, you know can I yeah can I talk to you? Do you have time? And he'd like sure, bro. I, uh, can you come by in an hour? And I'd be like, yeah, uh-huh. sure, I'll be there. And he'd be there and offering me a cup of coffee and we'd yeah. sit and talk and I'd keep it brief, you know, and and we we I'd say what I had to say and he would offer whatever you know, suggestion or help. I, I, I was, uh, you know, wow. requesting and just so gracious. There was never, it was never, there, there was never any, I never felt any haste yeah. from him. You know what? I really, yeah. really didn't. Yeah. I, 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 you know, there's this really strange time that I walked out of the back parking lot of SAR and there was, and Leonard was out there by himself. It was a beautiful sunny day and he was in an, dress immaculate in a suit like he was in often and i don't even know how this happened or why or but i just remember he was sitting on the pavement in the suit like just sitting down soaking up the sun like with his you know like arms resting on his knees and i said i said i just walked up and i and i as i didn't even stop i just walked past and as i walked past i just said how it's a beautiful day and he was like it certainly is you know it was like 
he could have <laughs> that was it. I didn't want to bother him or I just kept on going and I just thought, Wow, there's this guy that I'm sure there were people that worked there running out of offering him a chair or whatever later and he was probably like, Oh no and got back up and left again or something. So Sure. Was yeah. So cool. You know, I, I just wanna appreciate I wanna thank you so much for spending all this time and your schedule. I wanna ask you, is there anybody out there that uh that you'd like to play with that you haven't had the opportunity to play with yet? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a few, I don't want to say. Oh, okay. All uh, right. At this time. Sure. Um, there. Okay. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, there, I, I, I would love, I would love to work, work with, uh, some people very much in, in particular, Okay. Uh, I, I can say like my fa- like one of my fantasies would would be you know like you two just because I've I've met them and Larry is so nice he's just such a nice guy I'd be like I almost feel like I want to come go hey Larry can I just play one song but I know that'll never happen uh, yeah you know it could it could definitely I mean I think they're you know I yeah I mean I got to meet Bono and Edge at one point they came through for a benefit they played just a, as a duo Bono and the Edge at the Hollywood Bowl one night and it was you know. Wow. Yeah, it was a pretty big deal. He, yeah, as a matter of fact, I mean, I worked with their uh, with their main tech uh, there the whole day and getting all the best amps and Edge's reverb unit or whatever. And they, uh-huh. they were super cool. He, he dropped they dropped off some really nice mementos to me, and that was just you know, it was just like so. I think that uh, it it's That's in, cool. It's in your cards. I think. Yeah, I think you could. I think you could definitely because uh, I know you know they did that video of Tower of the Song with him uh i don't know if you've ever seen that yeah yeah, yeah. it's pretty classic oh yeah oh yeah the, the, well the, you know um my wife and i prior to even knowing that leonard was thinking about putting a band together uh this is in the fall of 2007 uh shannon and i were living in the guest cabin of her grandparents um i call it like estate uh-huh. it's a you know it's like a compound on uh pine island drive along the caddo along caddo lake okay in northeast texas uh-huh. and it's in a town about 30 30 minutes from shreveport louisiana it's in a town called uncertain texas wow uh-huh it's popular population 150 people okay (laughs) and there was nothing to do in this cabin except cook watch local tv and watch dvds and because we were so remote and we weren't sure what we were doing with ourselves then we had moved out of austin relocated to los angeles for a year nothing happened Uh and then i went on tour through europe with uh tito and tarantula Uh and once that was over we were in back in in east texas and uh, her Mimi offered the guest cabin to us, and it was in this little town called Uncertain. And we stayed there from September till about January, February of 2008. And um, during that time, we'd make these trips over to a town called Longview, yep. Texas. Um, and because they had everything, <laughs> you know, uh-huh, they had uh-huh. they had stores, they had they had stuff to do. Yeah. And one time we were at a blockbuster video, and as we were leaving. They had this uh, DVD, um, like for five dollars, bin, and one of them was the uh, documentary by Leon Lunson, okay. "I'm Your Man," yeah, which is the uh, concert that that she documented at uh, the Sydney Opera House with interviews and and stuff. And and I had told Shan, I said, you know, we should get this. Are you into Leonard Cohen? She says, uh-huh. well, I've heard of him. Yeah, I said, well, let's get it, and we watched it, and we just sat there all night just. You know, looking at it, and I had met Leonard back in 1988 in Oslo, Norway, and I remember uh-huh. how nice he was. Yeah. Uh, and I just and and I remember after meeting him, thinking to myself, uh, you know, it'd be great to work with a guy like uh-huh. that. Yeah, look at that. And, and then I and then I <laughs> and then I ran into him again six months later in uh, New York City uh-huh. in 1988, uh, and we were our paths just crossed each other you know, walking on the street. It was he, des- he remembered yeah. meeting me in Oslo, Norway. And I just thought, yeah, this guy's the, See? you know, destiny. This guy's got something. Destiny. So, so years later, we're watching, uh, I'm your man. I'm thinking to myself and I'm telling her the story about when we met and stuff like that. And and then we just let it go. You know, and, we, and I remember both of us sitting on the couch there watching you two 
with Leonard and this lady dancing around yeah. uh, uh, to uh, Tower of Song and just thinking that's pretty cool. You yeah, know? yeah. I mean, here's here's like a, here's <laughs> yeah. like a guy I I've I've always wanted to work with, and here's a band. I would love to work with, but, uh-huh. <laughs> but they're, but, but, they're, but they're working with each other. So that's fine. And so, um, anyway, long story short, the first time we played, um, Dublin at the Kilmain and, uh, there was off to like on the monitor side of the stage was Daniel and edge uh-huh. and Bono right. watching the show. Yeah, they were. Um, <laughs> and then, um, about two months later we were in, um, Nice, uh-huh. uh, doing a show outside, and they were there again. Uh-huh. And then the following year, they they weren't at the monitor side; they were at the front of house. I think they they have a residency in in south of France somewhere, so okay. they popped over. And then a year later, we played this place called the Sportsman's. Oh, the Sportsman's Club. We did two nights there. It holds only 900 people. We've been playing arenas up to this point, and we're doing two nights at this place. It holds 900 people because the seats are stupid expensive. They're for, like, oligarchs. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) You know, you know, know, people like, you know, (laughs) yeah, like like some of the fans that we were used to seeing in the front all the time. Oh, my gosh. Right. Weren't there because they can't (laughs) afford it. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) And, uh. But in the front, we saw like Elton John. Wow. We saw um, we saw some other uh, dignitaries, and in the back were all of you too. They were all there. Wow. And rock um, royalty came out. And so, so when I saw Elton John, I thought of my wife Shannon, who had wanted me to to pass a message on to him um, about these piano keys that uh-huh. that she had made, and um, in, down in Panama. And I thought, man, this is this is I gotta do this. So I didn't even wait to like get out of my my stage outfit. I just ran outside, <laughs> and I'm going out there. And Elton John is standing like almost nose to nose talking to Edge. Uh-huh. And so I don't want to interrupt that conversation. And just a few feet away is Larry Mullen Jr. just yeah. standing there waiting for Edge. Yes. So I strike up a conversation with him, and we start talking about things about drums and wow. how I do what I do and how he does what he does. Wow. And of course, I have to gush a little bit and just say, man, you know, I just love sure. love your band. I love sure. your playing, and I and yeah, I, I I I know you know you've got like you know the best gig in the world, but right. I just think you've got the best gig in the world. <laughs> And it was nice to meet you, and I shook his hand and walked away, and he finally gets Edge away from Elton John. They start heading off, and as they're heading off, I hear from behind my back, Raphael, and it's Larry. He says, follow me. And so I follow him uh-huh. and Edge, and we're going back. We're going like around the theater into this dark area, this little parking area, and there's this white van. And he's going to the van. He said, I want to introduce you to, to, to my partner, Anne. And um, that's the, that's that's been like, the lady in his life since high school yeah and um and so and so i meet and edge gets in larry gets in and then larry taps the guy in the front seat on the passenger side and he turns to me and it's bono and bono extends his hand and shakes my hand and says yeah. good show and i said hey i saw we saw you guys a month earlier at croke park and dublin man on the 360 tour you guys were so awesome <laughs> he's like yeah that was a good night i'm like okay fine good night <laughs> thank wow. you, you know? when i yeah. i it's like when i when i saw bono i just said i i said he he just looked at me and he goes good to see you and i said good to see you too and he went ah and he pointed his finger oh <laughs> Oh, he probably he probably does that every time. He's like, yeah. "Yep, got another one." Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and then yeah, uh, it was, uh, I was right before I was moving to New Zealand, and he had I'd got this bootleg uh, signed CD that in, as a gift from them, saying "Fast Tony, moving moving way too fast." And then he crossed out Tony and wrote Bono. <laughs> <laughs> that was it so but uh you know I, there's a quote supposedly by bob dylan saying to leonard cohen you're number one i'm number zero <laughs> i don't know if you've heard that uh, before or something yeah that sounds like something he would say yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think uh you guys uh, did the band your band uh did you guys visit uh bob uh, at a show in europe uh, at one occasion where you guest of their their band at a show i thought i heard uh, 
we saw them in um, the time we saw them was that first uh, 30 days we were out and we were in um, uh, Newfoundland. Okay. Yeah, they wanted to see the yeah. Leonard Cohen show, and I know that they were probably like, "Hey, please be our guest," you know. I I don't think they saw us. I mean, if they did, it might it might have been somewhere else that I didn't hear about. But we uh -huh. got to see them at the. We, we were both playing the same uh, hockey arena next door to the hotel, and um, it was it was Saint it was Saint John's Saint John's Newfoundland, and um, they came. Uh, to play that night and we went to see them and they put us in one of those club boxes off uh -huh. to the side okay and bob and bob always had his back to leonard he was playing to the side <laughs> yeah he wasn't playing to he wasn't playing to the audience he was playing with his with his left side to the audience so that his backside was towards leonard we never got to see him yeah it was yeah. very strange For sure um was... and, and it was very bob dylan yeah you know? Yeah, poor Bob. But, uh, but we got we, we got to <laughs> we got to see them. I, uh, I I was hoping Charlie was was going to be in the band, but he wasn't with them then on that tour. He had taken some time off. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, a, a guitarist named Denny Freeman was yep. uh, was in the band at the time. Another yeah. Austin, Texas guy. Yeah, yeah. And, and unfortunately, he left us too soon. He's, I believe he's. Yeah, finished, yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, Raphael, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I totally appreciate you sitting down here and sharing so much about you and your stories. And I want to urge uh, people also go check out your solo record, Waiting for Buddha. Uh, the Way We Live uh, was one of the tracks I really enjoyed there. And uh, it kind of gave me some recollections when I was hearing it. Jason Faulkner solo stuff from a uh, guy from Jellyfish, also Rufus Wainwright. Oh, wow. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Rufus Wainwright, too. Wow, I, I love Jason. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's a yeah. good friend of my brother's and got to know him when I in the years I lived in Hollywood and just uh just wow. Yeah, yeah, I wish that guy the best too. I hope he's doing great. He's there's so many talented musicians out there that you're just like what are they doing and where are they and it's just so hard to break through and there's 60,000 songs getting uploaded every day and <laughs> music songs of song files have almost become digital calling cards, you know, and People are just working, so, yeah. working so hard just to try to, you know, get uh, get a footing. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is there anything else that you want to uh, add in closing? Uh, I maybe didn't bring up or didn't ask you. you. You've touched on so much stuff. I really appreciate it. It's really cool. I know people will be excited to hear your stories. Always go where you're invited, as long as it's safe. All right, I like that. Okay, that's good advice, and we'll end on that. Uh, Rafael Gaiol, appreciate you uh, coming on Captain on the Rocks podcast, and uh, all the best to you. Thank Con you, Tony. Continued success. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Take care.